it's um it's one of those runs slack and a bunch of other events so oh and somebody just kind of runs through the door so and letting letting somebody in i'd appreciate it. <laughs> thank you unfortunately that door always locks so that's the way it works uh so let me guess here a lot of kids out here who is looking for a job Okay, so yeah. and it's just like the same people will raise their hands for all three of my questions so far. All right, so there, we do have um, a network of, of jobs that we post both on Slack. I've got some list here, so some some places to look at them that, that always have kind of have jobs to filter here in the area. Site plan, how do you make those works? Are on those. Blue Wave is one of our partners, and they've got a few. She's open right now. Senior.net developer, pipeline platform engineer, Trova. I'm not here tonight. So Trova also has a senior cyber network, security engineer, data visualization manager, data quality knows. Um, another place to check out is Informulate, which is another one of our sponsors who tends to have jobs as well. Again, once you get on the Slack, if you're not on the Slack, the Slack also has jobs for it, but sometimes it's pretty active. Um, you know. The tech job market, I know, is pretty weird, but so up and down. Um, but how many, on that note, we've got people looking for jobs. Does anybody have jobs? Anybody have a job that you want to share? Hmm. Wow. Okay. Usually I get like a bunch of kids, but not this time. Okay. Well, there will be jobs, and there are some jobs. So um, I would also recommend Troba is a, is a good resource to reach out to. If you're looking for jobs, because they'll do some coaching if you want some. So they're a good resource to reach out to to get some coaching on like how to go about the job search and stuff without necessarily committing to anything with them. There's no cost to you or anything like that. So um, we are actually on May 6th, we're going to have a, a special event that's all about getting jobs as developers in Orlando. So it's going to be here. Uh, so look for that coming up as well. So that's just, that's something we're going to try and run. We're going to do like resume review and all kinds of things like that that hopefully help you increase your job search. So um, all these things we do, unfortunately, they're not free. So you know, just shout out to our sponsors, Blue Wave, um, which I mentioned earlier, the Formulate as well, uh, NB Labs, who uh, if you don't know, they're a small consulting agency downtown. SIVO uh, does a lot of like serverless and cloud stuff. Um, we also have a number of people who support us via our Patreon. Um, so like when you when you, if you're on the Slack, you know it's, we have the paid Slack, and that's because of our Patreon members. There are shares, but like, you can grab one as long as you put it back. Grab one from one of the desks around. And then, yeah, um, a lot of that. I think I don't know if there's any back there. Let's come over and see. Um, there are other seats over there. Um, yeah. you open? No? All right. Yeah, just pull one from a desk or something if you can. Um, so, uh, as well as Trova, again, our, one of our, um, our recruiter sponsors, and Credo Conduit for giving us the space um, and, uh, and all that. So, thanks to all of our sponsors for making it possible to do this and to get you pizza. And you like That's my favorite. I think pizza. pizza is really good. I haven't tried it. It's not just pizza. It's like a little place on um, hills. Um, seeing folks that do pig toys. <clears throat> really like food. So, and you know, we used to, every time we used to do um, pot of jobs, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. So once I got, once I was able to like be like, okay, you can get what you want. I just just submit the receipts. I'm like, yes, no more pot of jobs. I'm done with that. Okay, so. Odes Slack. Uh, any of you not on the Odes Slack? Yeah? Okay. Quite a few of you. Okay. You should be on the Odes Slack. It's a great place to connect with folks uh, in between these meetings. Uh, so if this is going to take you to a form, because we, we keep that Slack private so it's only Orlando folks. So it's going to take you to a form you're going to fill out. I will probably get around to it on Friday to let everybody in. It's not an automated thing, unfortunately. Because we get a lot of people trying to get in who are like trying to uh, you know, send spam and things like that. 
I still make it through sometimes. So if you are on a Slack and you ever notice that, please let me know. Um, but yeah, this is taking to form. I will run, I run through about once a week and, and let everybody in. Everybody who needed it, got it, got it. It's just the Orlando devs.com. That's it for me. Uh, I know Ricardo, where are you? Okay, Ricardo had something you want to say before we get to our first speaker. Oh, this is all super tangled up. It's, uh, it's bad. Yeah, I did a bad job. You're doing a great job. Everybody give a pause to it, right? Uh, so, um, for those of you in the night of Ricardo Williams, I host a little event called Nerd Night. Have you guys heard of Nerd Night? Yes, no, I feel a lot of nerds. Wow, I'm doing a terrible job of doing this. Because I've been doing it for 11 years. So, uh, um, so anyway, uh, Nerd Night is an event that I host regularly where we bring together guest speakers. And essentially, the speakers make presentations where they nerd out on some of the passions of. Uh, we've been doing this every single month since March 14, 2013. We also have a special Comic Con in South by Southwest. We just released a book on um, St. Martin's Press where we uh, essentially made essays. Some of our most popular internet talks around the world. Um, but the reason why I'm here with you all tonight is because we're doing a new thing that I've wanted to do for years. Is that uh, for a really long time, folks would come to your night. And uh, I mean, all of you, it's about 30 older than, uh, than a few of you here. Uh, maybe a few of you here as well. Um, but for years, I've been here for night. Someone would come and say, like, Well, what are you doing? For, what are you doing for tea? And I'd be like, I would love you to make work for young people, but I don't want to do more work. So we, Want to volunteer anybody? And of course, they say no. Um, but uh, about a year ago, my kid Katie, she uh, decided she wants to take on this responsibility. Um, and she said to me, "I want to do something like Nerd Night, but for my age group." And so, for the last months, we've been working on a thing called Nerd Night Meets Gen, where essentially we we'll like everybody except we're going to center the teenagers as the speakers, and Katie's going to be the host. So you won't have to listen to me and ramble on and make terrible jokes or anything. It'll be young people kind of leading the discussion, and I'm telling you, these kids are so good, it's so amazing that they've been wanting to talk about it. So the reason why I'm here with you all tonight to share this news is that some of you that are older than me or my age might have kids who are teenagers or young adults, and please, please uh, plug them into this event. The event is designed specifically for teenagers. I granted, some of us older ones can come, um, but the idea is that we center them as people and kind of support them we can you know, grow as speakers and get excited about science. And as Katie says, we want to use this event to like, bring together the science community. And as I was just chatting with my friend here on the side, um, you know, after COVID, we were saying, you know, some people, you know, it was hard to get them to go back to events and in-person stuff. Or, um, but for me, it was the exact opposite. The nerd night, people were hungry to be together. And what I'm seeing a lot of the Katie generation, a lot of kids just aren't spending time together. And they're just they're literally their only connection through the internet, which is great, you know, for awful people like me, but it can't be the only way that they exist. So hopefully things like this can contribute to our young people coming together and talking about science and tech. So um, our first event we're gonna make sure will be uh, May 11th at the Orlando Public Library. Um, I'm happy to chat about it later on after you I'm sitting around after the event to talk about it or find me on social media. My name is Carl Williams and very really nice, etc. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to tell you guys about that. And if you have anybody in your family or household or friends or neighbors that we want to be involved, we'd love to have you join us on the day. And also, part of that gives out prizes. Mine is a new process, but she's like, let's keep going. I guess it's incentivized kids to, to show up to people talking about you. Guys. So anyway, thank you guys for listening to me. And uh, again, I want to pause with Ryan because I've been privately coming to OEM for quite a few years now. It's always a great audience because you have great speakers. You guys have an incredible job. Bringing together folks in tonight. So, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for letting me. All right. So, yeah, um, if you haven't checked out Nerd Night as well, I, mean, I, I definitely think you should. It's one of those events that you don't have to, you, you can bring your non developer friends and they will enjoy it too. You know, so like, it's it's just a, it's a great thing to be able to kind of go and just have, have fun. Um, so, it's a great, great networking event. So, check that out. I definitely want to talk to you because I think my son um, is an off up for speaking. <laughs> he, he could. He, he could. I just I have to check it if I think he should. If, you know, he, he's like, my son's a bird fanatic. Like, he knows everything about birds. It's like, I don't know. Yeah. Right. You know. All right. So, where am I? Should... 
Okay. Yes. You had a question? I just wanted to know, what are the challenges that you face in There's cables everywhere. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. Uh, so, yeah, thanks everyone for showing up tonight. Uh, big thanks again to Brian. Uh, this this uh, event is not free. We have the money to put on. Uh, so, I appreciate everything he does. Uh, so, this talk technically tonight is uh, the first of two I would like to give. Um, if Brian doesn't meet me by the end of the night, maybe he'll only do a second one. Um, and yeah, so we're going to talk about getting insured. And uh, insurance here is going to be a metaphor for our software, for our applications, and uh, how we can actually better our software over time. Uh, and just, just so everyone's aware, uh, I don't intend this to be a lecture. Um, this is, I, I like this to be a two-way street. Um, so if you have a question, I mean, there will be q and at the end, so don't worry about that. If you have a question, raise your hand, it's fine. Uh, if you have some context, go ahead. Uh, I, I just don't want this to be like a back to college and I'm just lecturing you. Um, so that's just a good thing. So this is a long walk. Longer than enough. Okay, so uh, real quick, who am I? Uh, my name is uh, Michael Bravica. Uh, I'm one of the three Mike Bs we have already around here. I don't know, are the other two Mike Bs around here? No. Okay. They know better. They just show up. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm a senior software engineer at United Press Entertainment. Um, if you don't know, we're the team partner now that has the Dolphins, so I'll let you figure that one out. Um, I spent five years as a consultant in the professional services industry doing consulting. Um, and then I've been about a full stack on as developer for about 10 years. Um, so a little bit of that is actually very important. Um, just a disclaimer, uh, this talk is obviously my personal thoughts and they do not necessarily reflect my employer. Have to get the legal part of the way. Um, does anyone here have any experience in insurance, in risk management, in asset protection? You, yes sir, 
What do we use insurance for? Managing risk. Well, Managing well, risk. That's a great one. Does anyone else? Did anyone else have to add to that? That's another good one. I was not thinking of that, but actually, okay, actually, yeah, kind of important. Anyone else know why we have insurance? Protect our assets. Okay, yeah, so those are the biggest examples of why we have insurance. Oh, we have an asset, which is a cost to us that if we lost it, would be detrimental to us, to our cash flow, and uh, we might not make it the next day, and we might lose a job, and then bad things happen. And um, humans have understood that concept for thousands of years. So even back to our Uyghur uh, days, thousands of years ago, and I'm going to go back to 1750 BC, because that's when the code of Amarabe was established. And if, in case you're curious, that is the code. So a very large code now, it's about my height. And then all the rules and laws uh, on it for what we call civilization back then. Civilization back then was slightly different, but that was civilization. Um, if, if you were paying attention in high school class, you probably would memorize this. So uh, it had a lot of rules for being all civilizations. Uh, but my fun one that I loved the most was if you as an engineer built a house and then uh, it was not structurally sound and that house collapsed, uh, they put you to death. Uh, not, not so nice. Uh, they also had a form of disaster relief. So let's say that you need to uh, for a piece of collateral for a home that you're going to build or for anything you need. And let's say that drought happened, um, the locust came, a hurricane came out of your house, something happened, or you were injured and they did not pay the loan back. Uh, there was provisions to where you might be forgiven entirely, or there was a portion of the debt that was forgiven. So that is the form of the first disaster relief fund that we kind of know of. And then more importantly, there was the first kind of insurance. And most of this insurance was for shipping markets. So you, as a merchant, could get a loan for goods that you needed to send from point A to point B. And let's say something happened that ship along the way. So uh, there was a mutiny, uh, the ship sank, there was piracy. And uh, by the way, you can still get piracy insurance. It's still a thing. Uh, the insurance carriers still allow you to get it. Um, and the event that something happened to that cargo, um, you were not personally liable for it. So you would essentially purchase a policy from whoever you were borrowing your money from, and you got a peace of mind that A, your car goes so you go from A to B, and you could actually sleep through the night and don't have to worry about A, you might lose your head because someone's coming for your money. So uh, why do we care about that, right? Uh, we're developers, uh, we don't deal with insurance, we deal with code. What's more important, I just want to ship my code and I want to get it from here to production as soon as possible, right? And that's a fair argument, I'm not going to argue with that. Um, so here's some code for you. Um, and by the way, uh, I'm a dominant developer, so this is .NET, so if you're Java, Intended it's Java, if you're uh, Python, pretend it's Python, and if you're PHP developer, I have some questions for you. Um, this is a secret application work, and it's blurry to me, but I know it's very blurry. So I'm going to tell you exactly what it does. So it's an application service that's going to sit between our presentation layer and our business layer, both of which I don't care about. Um, it's just going to handle the request. So I'm going to take the request. I'm going to go to my persistence model. I'm going to see if I can pull something out, check it for null. And then I'm going to update my internals, and then I'm going to save my objects, and then I'm going to return the result back for Very standard. You've seen this a million times. I've seen this a million times. It's pretty easy to understand. So uh, why why do we, as a new shipping merchants, uh, care about this? So what can I do to ensure, that ensure with an E, that my code goes from point A to point B without piracy, without something blowing up? Without an exception, to start my day, what can I do to ensure my code is okay? And if you were like, or am I, oh, okay. Yes. Oh, I can test it. Congratulations. Yeah. So I can run unit test, right? So here is the first unit test that I have. So in fact, this is one of three unit tests that I need to write for this because I have three logical branches. So I need three unit tests, right? I have a null check, and then I have a conditional check at the end, which is true or false. And so that is three unit tests. So here's the first. Uh, pretend the other two are there, they're just off the screen. Um, and then these are, if you write insurance, if you write unit tests, this is the best insurance that you can buy as a developer. It's better than manual QA, it's better than have, letting your users test stuff, it's better than having a fun open beta, and then you get to find all the bugs there. You have something that you can run anytime you want, whatever you want, forever you want, and you can ensure with an eye design that the behavior is always the same. You have written yourself an insurance policy. And just like in real life, your insurance policy has cost you time and money, right? 
uh, in real life, it takes me time to research my uh, insurance. I need to know what I need. And then I have to pay a company money every month. And then they're going to make money off my money. And then they're not going to give me my money back when I file a claim, right? Because that's when it happens with insurance companies. But here I've spent time too. I've spent time creating my uh, unit test. And then I've spent money, maybe it's not my money, but it is my employer's money on my salary to write the test. And the payoff is that I get the insurance from the test every single time I run it. I get the behavior that I want. And that, that's all fine and dandy. And just like in real life, we have multiple types of insurance policy, right? So I have health insurance, I have car insurance, I have home and rental insurance, right? Um, and then there are more standard, more advanced types of insurance, right? I can go buy some life, I can buy some metal, I can buy an umbrella. Uh, I can even buy some really, really uh, insurance products, right? I can buy some insurance products that are not technically insurance. We can go into inception like levels of reinsurance and then reinsurance for reinsurance. And I know it's like, because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and there's just a million products you can buy, right? And you can annuitize a retirement fund and then you can get a guaranteed result. You can get marriage insurance, you can get a pre I don't know if your wife knows about that. Um, you can do a bunch of things like that. And then we developers have a same kind of gamut of tools that are available to us. Uh, and I'm going to I split this onto two sides. So I have I have as a developer, we have three types of tests we can We can write unit tests, we can write integration tests, and we can write annual tests. And then we have other people in our organization who might be responsible for the right side. And I'm not going to get into semantics because I realize this is a Venn diagram, and I realize that there is overlap on both. And if your organization is like having territory fights to where uh, it's this is my side and this is your side, then I think you have bigger problems than I'm talking about tonight. Uh, and then just to clarify, uh, when I say unit test, I mean something that is tested in isolation. When I say integration test, I mean something that probably hits your persistence layer, maybe it's a database, maybe it's something else. And when I say Android test, I'm talking about something that you run in the front end. Uh, so if you're in Node, this is going to be like Cypress. If you're in Java.net, this is probably going to be Playwright. And you may or may not be going over the wire. Again, I'm not here to split hairs and touch the Um And just like in real life, I get under insured, right? Uh, I can not buy the insurance coverage I need. I can have a new Maserati and go to the collision coverage. Not a smart idea. Um, I can not have the right staff of insurance on my car. I can do all these things that under insured me. We probably witness the consequences of that to one end. Just like in uh, software, I can underinsure as well. I can just not test. Right? That's a great way to underinsure. I can have unit tests and not integration tests. And you realize that bikes through the flood and we have a DD migration and then nothing works anymore. Or um, the same way I can overinsure, right? I can have too much coverage. If I throw a whole product on this today, I probably don't need the closure coverage because I think it's worth $500. So I don't need $1,000 in closure coverage for a $500 vehicle. Um, and the same thing in software, I can overinsure too. I can test the peripheral sticks. I can test branches that will never hit. I can test uh, state coverage. I can test line coverage. None of those are really important to what I want to test. So, and this is a learned skill, right? So I'm going to go back over here. Uh, so I saw a lot of new people today, right? So I saw a lot of hands. So if this is all like just a stream of consciousness blurring you and you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's fine. Because uh, when I was probably at your level, I probably had no idea what I was talking about too either. So this is not something that's just, oh, I know I'm not good. Um, just like how you're learning to code, you need to learn how to test. It's it's the same, but it's not the same. So at the first time you do it, you won't hate it. You'll hate your life. And you'll think it's dumb. And then one day, you'll keep doing it. As long as you do it, the light bulb will click. And you will have that moment when you realize, thank you, goodness, that I have my unit test and saved my data. I assure you of that. So we need a car to drive to work, and we need a house or an apartment to live in, right? So a uh, question, I'm maybe I'm sure the guy's going to answer this because he's, he's just got the biggest smile on his face right now. So before I buy a car, and before I buy a house, and before I sign a lease on an apartment, what do I need to show? What do I need to show people before I do any of those? I'm sorry? That's one of them. That's good. I need proof of insurance, proof of insurance right? So uh, it goes to show that I need insurance before I can buy the car or buy the house. Now, the insurance policy does not get me food. The insurance policy does not drive me to work. And the insurance policy does not make me money. It does none of those. 
but it does allow me to make those abilities to do so. So if I had a car up here, and I'm going to make sure it's pulls down here, I can draw a clear line, just draw a line, from the car to the insurance policy. So the insurance policy is more important than the car, even though it has functionally zero use in my day-to-day -day operations, right? It is still more important. Um, I, I can make that decision. So why do we, as rational people, right, we're all engineers, right, everyone, we're all rational people, we pride ourselves being rational people, we have rational thoughts, and then we, that's how we see the world. Why do we have all these rational thoughts when it comes to real life? Why do we say to ourselves, oh, yeah, I need that, I need that. But then when it comes to software, you just, eh, it's okay. I don't need a unit test because I'm better than everyone else. I don't need to test because my code always works. I don't need to test because my code is always working. It always will work, right? That is the kind of hubris that we, as software engineers, uh, have to go deal with. And it's probably not all of us. And we know someone who talks like that, right? So back to my first example, because people love this. Um, I have a game, I C Sharp, and this is dumb code, so I pretend it's just whatever language you have. And I have the easiest, simplest example of dependency reduction that I can think of, right? So do we all know what the dependency reduction is? And if we don't, I simply just pass it a dependency into my constructor, and that's it. We like dependency reduction. Congratulations. Um, I would say that uh, what is the reason for that? Is it why do we use it? What's the point? Anyone want to answer that? I'm sorry? Yes, that's one, but I, I, I want a slightly different one. Yes, sir. I can use the proxy. Oh, that's really very close. You're getting very warm. Yes, sir. Yes, we're we're so warm. We're so hot. It's Florida, but we're still so hot. I saw him. Did you see him? I'm sorry. Verse yes. Well, we're practically burning. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't hear you. Yeah, we're always the rolling boulders. Okay, yes. Okay, but, but what, what do I what am I mocking in? What am I what 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 am I running in? Okay. Yes, testing. That's what I want. Okay. So I I, 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 I I'm I'm sorry. It's a trick question, man. It's a trick question. That's right. Okay, so yeah, I need to test it, but let's think about this. Do I do I really need it, right? Like, uh, so if I run my code at runtime, right? I mean, I actually, that's it. It's an interface, by the way. It's, it's an interface. I don't need that interface, right? Because um, in dependency injection, I have one implementation type for one interface. So it's always the same concrete type every time I run the application, every single time. It never changes. So like, you know, I really don't need this at runtime. But like you said, I need this because I need the right test for that. So let me say that again, just to get my point, because I haven't done it at all. I am required to change my application service code because my testing requires it. So what have I drawn there? I have drawn a dependency where I said that my application code needs to change because of my tests. Therefore, my tests are more important than my application code. And I know that's kind of weird and wacky because uh, unit tests do not sell product. Unit tests do not make people like, go crazy. Unit tests do not make a single dollar of revenue. But like, just like insurance, unit tests allow you to do all of that. So I'm going to tell you what happens when we don't unit test, when we don't run our same unit test, our unit test. So here's what's going to happen when you go to our unit test because you're the perfect developer and you're the most of And uh, to uh, show you, I've seen this happen in real life multiple times in matrix style slow mo, where I saw the project just go long. The edge and just go down like this. So you start a new project, everyone's happy, everyone's great, the shipping code, clients happy, we're all making money, and then slowly over time it gets harder and harder and harder. And a bug comes up and you miss a release, and there's an issue with the release, and then there's more bugs to come. And ooh, that was unexpected to move over that and see it happen. Right? And things get harder to change. And then oh, everyone's getting and my product manager is going down my back because it's like, once again, I get down, once again, I get down. And then I just start not working on it. And then finally, 
as the things become so hard to change and we can't do anything, we're like, we just read about the Bible. Right? And then we waste all that time rewriting. Um, we don't learn any of the lessons from our mistakes. And then in three or five years, we can write the application again because we didn't correct any of our mistakes. And that's all because we put our main test aside. And if there's ever a time, if there's ever a time when you over the same or when your team over the problem and everyone hates it, and you can't look at the code and the code is disgusting, I guarantee you, you have a they found the point of no return and you need to find your programming pieces. And I'm gonna tell you right now, programming pieces will show you the what but you need to put automated pieces first. Every single product that I have seen that has failed from a fundamental level of we can't make changes anymore because the code is too hard did not be automated. Automated test first. So here's what it's going to look like when you do the automated test first, and you're going to hate your life, and you're going to hate your life for the first couple months of your project. And you're going to say, This is dumb. This is dumb. I hate my life. This is stupid. I just want to write code. I just want to write code. Why can't I just shift code? And then slowly we like, I'm glad I had a new Oh, I'm glad I have this integration test because what we did is integration. Oh, okay, I missed something. I couldn't have missed it, but I have an integration test. And then eventually, the product test is true. You're like, oh, I'm glad I have this automated student test that I can verify that my application works exactly how I intend it to because I see the behavior of that. And then once you realize this, once you put an automated test in course, this whole new program. It's going to go open up, and you're going to just see everything in a completely new light. Um, and you're going to realize, like, oh, I just can't do things the way I used to. Like, I just can't keep going down the same road tracks that I used to. So, uh, things like public centers, oh, I can't handle it anymore because why? Because it's an initialized option with different core values, and I can't even test that. I'm no more private than that. I can't even test those. Um, non pure center, that's a no go. That's not a fancy. Um, and then it's starting to get a little more easy, get a little more advanced. And so you find that I have a lot of service calls, and what I call lack of service calls, I ask for SLA, it's called service calls, and then it's called service calls. And then I try to write you, and I have five of them. It's going to take me 15 minutes to set up this one unit test, and I never want to do that again. And so I'm like, oh, I probably need to do that. And then finally, I'm going to come up with additional programming, the switch sheet has about a dozen options in them, and you have if else. And just to remember, every time you have an if else, that's two logical versions. That's two unit tests. So if you have in one file, it's just you have to write the test, right? And I can um, I can do an architecture. So once I do that, I'm like, oh, I actually I can have to be abstract of an architect. So I can't be more hard to test my database. Um, I can't use that static log code anymore. I can't just have my SMT SMT getting called. I have to call it out to you. I have to use proper design patterns. What a concept. Um, I can't just not on a loop and I mean, um, just because it's fun for everyone else, right? I have to make sure that all these things are in the personal ethos of what is good and what is bad. And what is good is automated testing. Everything else is not good at all. And then I also have to reevaluate some libraries in my life. Um, you know, maybe I don't want a dynamic, non static library. Because it's just, it's not good. Automatically. Um, and then we can take this one step further. So I have to use one application to apply this. It's basically all my applications. Because I have this suite of unit tests now that I can work anytime I want, whenever I want. So what do I want to do? Uh, I want to work on the tests whenever I commit, whenever I get So what does that sound like? It sounds like a DevOps platform. So I'm going to need one of those. And because we all have the, uh, the uh, test goldfish I need to run I need to run snap. So those tests are not snap. And, and you see, all we did, all we did, all these changes that we made for our application in short code, this is because we need short code to right? We said, okay, I'm going to forget about the code, because code doesn't matter. I'm just going to put my automated test in this. And then everything after that, I'm going to see the And it all took is we flipped the switch. And, and so I would like to, uh, I know people did a lot of one year more stuff. Careers, maybe not careers. I'm going to tell you right now. There's two types of people in our industry, and I'm not going to talk about the boundaries, but this is just what I see. Uh, so you have people who just want to code, and that's fine. If you just want to code, that's fine. And then you have people who have 
for the short term work on my life, there's a there's a task I can test, I go to this and test as well. That is a short term. Um, and then there's a long-term property where I'm like, okay, I have something to do and I want to find the best way to do it. And I'm not doing it just for me, I'm doing it for everyone else. And I'm doing it for everyone else who will eventually be able to do it. I'm tired of that. It's five years. I want them opening the screen mode and saying, who the hell wrote this code? Because that would be embarrassing. And I would say that's more of an engineering approach. Right? So you have the short term approach and more. And uh, I can tell you right now that I'm uh, cheap. Coders are cheap, and finding coders are cheap. Um, I can go to a, a code camp in three months. I can find a code. Uh, how do I know that? Because I've been to a code camp in three months. I can go. Congratulations. Um, I, I highly recommend that you align yourself more to the engineering side. That will make you more desirable and it will make you better in your career. So, the same points I have given tonight are first of all, put your own in test books. Um, and you need developers, so you can get a test and you need to test. If you're from that, you need. Uh, your test your code not the other way around. So the automated test is first, and let your application derive from what you did. And then thirdly, uh, you need to focus on branching. Uh, there's statements of line coverage. I think those are very large consumers. Don't worry about it. Uh, keep your branch coverage one percent, and then obviously like doing the test with one part of your you know, test instead of file. Uh, and then I course, the class, so uh, if you want to retain that URL, you know, uh, if you're an developer and have a couple of open source projects, um, you might want to check out my companies, but you might not. Any questions? Questions? Yes, questions. Uh, so you were saying there like sort of like a list of things that like really don't go well with testing? Yeah, because you can't. You just straight up can't test. So you're saying you can go with like comments, and there's some like Object oriented design patterns that like look first that like work well with Yeah, so um, our handles, but just make sure everything doesn't look like an handle. So there is a place. Um, if I could tell design pattern that I think is overlooked the most and would be most useful, that service block is chain responsible. That's the one I feel is the most underrated of all good instances. So it's and again, they're they're not like uh, they're not a silver bullet. So just use them for like you use to assist. Yes. Uh, a metaphor about right? compliance with the development of like unit coding and then can you go to that like or not create like around it? Yeah, I don't I don't really care if you use this for development or not. I, I don't think that's sure that you personally. I don't care that you know. That's I don't care how it's tested. I don't care when it's tested. I mean, I care when obviously you write it alongside. But um, just just write the test. So however way you find the best way to do it, um, just write it. And, and I would say like um, be careful. There are tools out there. Um, and they're they're good, but you have to obviously like you still have to you can't make it hundred percent. So um, and then they can they can also like so just be careful about that. Yes. No, you're right. Yeah, because you know, every project that is more as, as anyone I've ever they actually write the test like I've never seen it. I mean, I, I, I have to put it in my own stuff. You just write as you go. Yeah, it's, it's that simple. It's, it's not a, 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 so, and, 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 so you know, like uh, something happens, right? And your boss goes, "This is all up on Saturday afternoon." He's here. You're like, "Oh, just boss, I don't know. We didn't do it over, so we do it, right?" Is that gonna is that gonna be good? No, it's gonna make you look like not smart. Okay, right. But if you're like, uh, 
Yes, well, we had we had uh, a two coverage. We caught it because it broke in a pipeline that ran over the week. Well, what did you do? You say, okay, well, you saved your job. And you probably saved someone else's job. You probably saved some of your job's part, right? Because you didn't have to drag it over the weekend. I'll fix this, right? So, yes, we talked to you guys. That there, there's, uh, I don't mean to uh, think about it, but there's, there's no one out there. Uh, 
virtual machines, this virtual machine needs this many cores, this much RAM, also person allows that to be and to get that immediately or at least a request immediately. And so with cloud, there's a there's a lot of resources. There's not just there's uh, networks, networks, and the reason the cloud do this is clouds kind of uh, the complexity is there. Cloud is trying to give developers as application developers the very right? They want they don't require in, uh, need. They don't really they don't have a lot of opinion. They give us just their purpose. We ourselves have to okay. Well, look this way. I want my IP address this way. We have to do that work ourselves. We want to use this block to do this machine. And so the kind of the fact that this is is why I brought up earlier, the, the community standard in cloud resources for, for producing them, for creating them, and also, also um, like I said, cross-sizing the idea of their form, I think it takes it up to another level. Uh, and I'll talk about it as well. Uh, the concept I want to cover so this is something that is trying to cloud and DevOps. It's really to specify all of the things that I've talked about about being this this way or my network, but as code, as things. And so there are benefits in terms of sharing it, get version control, there are benefits there in terms of being operable, being automatable. And so and so yeah, I guess kind of uh crossplane itself has the ability to practice. As code, uh, and so and so all to uh, answer global platform, which is another word in our industry to describe where this is all kind of all heading. So at the company, like I said, I work at India. We have a thousand engineers, but we have to kind of uh, figure out what's best. Uh, I'm on the team that figures out uh, for like ties in together with compliance wants, resource governance wants. All of these things take up a lot of my time. Team wants something different. We have to automate, that. and each of the each of the automations ends up having to be another another API. Well, ideally, it's another API. And if you're working with the company, you, you realize that now you're driven that you talk to a person about all the security. You go ahead and run. Uh, and you go ahead and make sure this is up to compliance. Um, these are kind of like big large company company problems. And so. IDP is a real problem. We just have an idea that all of that needs to be the application is all just doing that on their own. We should just do it in the tool set for they to do that on their own. I don't, I don't care about, or I don't want to waste time figuring out that stuff for them. I don't want to waste time looking into that application and figuring out what it's doing. I want it to be their job to go ahead and say, like, go through a tool and say this automatically. It's a tool compliance automatically. Um, and so yeah, this is kind of like, I have not yet a company that actually has a developer platform. It's kind of something we all talk about, it's like the ideal. Um, but uh, it's something that we're all like hopefully the industry is like we should probably start building these automations to best practice on a developer on a developer platform. Um, so yeah, did that okay? So yeah, this, like I said, I'm working on a lot of abstraction. So is, are there any questions? Because the, the next slide might have kind of face on. Yeah, it's just like infrastructure code. Is that kind of like where you can grab music from so like Gambler based on the price of like this feature of like your actual code or programming or infrastructure? Exactly, yeah. So it's essentially a your your AG for infrastructure written as. So there are definitely ways of going about it, but machine language like JSON or yeah, yeah, or it's kind of like. Language of uh, cloud uh, infrastructure. So, a lot of it, yeah. Um, yeah, the infrastructure cover kind of you take a language. But there, are, there are other two things that be kind of language I know, more so just any language to describe the infrastructure. JavaScript, Python, PHP, uh, to kind of describe the infrastructure. But then you get all the benefits of it. You get reusability, you get buttons, you get classes. You can, classes are very easy to um, that's kind of the better structure is going. Yeah. Uh, just in front of one. Okay, 
So, uh, we'll put that aside uh, in terms of like, uh, how to live about Kubernetes. Um, and hopefully, kind of see kind of patterns in them to discuss these in common. Um, so, yeah, as you can tell, like ChatGPT, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe a Zora yeah, show of Kubernetes uh, slide through. Uh, okay, so Kubernetes. Uh, I saw some talk earlier on that. What Kubernetes is. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Kubernetes more than a high level of Kubernetes itself. It's not things a lot of people just like uh, uh, And also, Kubernetes is one of those things that get complicated really quickly. Uh, when you go to the tent, like off the shelf Kubernetes, you search Kubernetes out on the application, it essentially allows you to kind of deploy and manage your application across a set of applications. Right? That's what's on uh, if you're on the documentation, if you ask that. What is Kubernetes? That's what it'll say. Um, that's not the fun part. I've been in Kubernetes world for quite a long time. Uh, the fun part for me is Kubernetes itself is introduced new ideas of how you, uh, you program it. Uh, the cross plane ties it. And so I kind of want to describe that programming model a little bit. But essentially, it's very similar to React. I'll tie that in together. React, we have a no group. Okay. Yeah. So it's a Kubernetes programming model. Uses is you state what you want, and then there's code that goes ahead and fulfill that state. It goes ahead and looks at you say, I want this, and then there's separate code that's like, okay, I'm gonna do that. Uh, and then in Kubernetes, the concept where you have a state, and then you have a controller in the background trying to make that happen. Uh, so in React, here, you say, This is what I want to look like, and you don't care how React. Goes ahead and updates the job. You, you, you go ahead and there are different notes, but you know in the background you have to build up to the job, right? You're not writing code to take this DOM element, change it down. You know we're actually going to take care of the story. Phrase the same way with the off, off the shelf. You say, I want this application to be replicated three times across these nodes. I don't care how it gets to it. Go ahead and like figure it out, figure it out for me. But this is what I want. This programming model. Like very, very powerful as we'll, as we'll get into. Um, so this is what I was talking about about what is that concept of Kubernetes that does support for you. Uh, so in Kubernetes, this is known as controllers, another name for operators, but essentially it's just basically a for loop that goes an infinite for loop that checks with what you set that state, what I want, that's just reality. Uh, so to, to do a example, Uber. Specifically, Uber Eats. When you order something, you know what I want. McDonald's here. You don't care. It's like somebody else's problem. You you said you said to the world, I want this burger here now. Like, you don't care if these guys take a spaceship over here from McDonald's to deliver it for you. That's somebody else's problem. It's a separation of control. That's something else. Uh, same thing with Amazon. If you order something, you don't care how it gets there. You care if the space comes to itself. Like he goes. Like how to get here is completely somebody else's responsibility. Same thing with controllers. Um, so kind of behind the scenes earlier with cloud resources and cloud configuration, you say I want this machine, this many CPUs, this much RAM, you don't care like how, how do I get here? You know what you want. Um, so you can see kind of how those like, like patterns start coming coming together. Uh, so yeah, that that Kubernetes, controllers, and all that makes sense. Like I said, we're working on some of the, if you don't have to see the other slides on the other side, it would be a little bit confusing. Any questions there? Okay, okay finally, uh, so this is a project that came out. Uh, it's a open source project, a company called Uptown. Uh, and so they just recently uh, well, graduated from the yeah. CF. What the CNCF uh, project is, it's really just an order to find out whether this is enterprise ready, ready for big time, big large companies. Uh, they don't want anything bigger, uh, companies are there. Uh, they don't want the open source project to be with one company and that company is and then they lose all the, the, all the work that goes into it. They want this to be robust. Uh, and so, yeah, open source project, I, I Using Kubernetes, that's the same model I talked about, to get you cloud infrastructure. 
you go ahead and you say, I want a beautiful way to be on Azure. You don't care about the details of how to get there for you. Those are the go ahead and do the work for you. So I'm checking that for loop to be like, okay, did that uh, uh, size change? Okay, we'll update on Azure. Update that on Azure. We will update that on Google. And yeah, so like I said, a lot of graduates. So the company there, and so yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead. And, yeah, I'll go ahead and talk about the experience of it, and then I'll go into the depth. So make it hopefully tie it all in together. Um, so installing the cross plane is installing the working Kubernetes. You install it on Kubernetes. Uh, you go ahead and use your Kubernetes uh, CTL tool and to cross plane. Go ahead and say look. So I want this database, I want this uh, this security bucket, and then prospect with that. He says, okay, I'll talk to you to get you the answer, but uh, we'll go ahead and do that in Google Cloud. The experience is working with it. Okay, so now we've gone ahead to the right here. This is what I want to talk about. Very similar to what it is in they're talking about YAML, uh, structure this code. In Prosper, uh, you go ahead and in YAML will specify the visit that you want. Um, and so Prosper is a building block called managed resource, uh, which is just essentially say what that resource that looks like should be, uh, what that uh, you know, database should look like. Imagine this right here. We can imagine I want uh, my SQL database, I want it to be this version. Uh, I want associated with it. Uh, um, I want the, the node that runs it. Um, and the prospect can do that. Do that. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are some links. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, cloud providers who get Azure their own languages and provision, right? Cloud formation, a blueprint is Azure, Google Cloud. Uh, but they all have their own languages. Um, they are very tight in a similar way of their frameworks. I'll do a comparison later. Uh, but you should cross plane a lot of them uh, cloud and learn a specific game uh, You do have to go ahead and all these specifications for uh, which are different from cloud providers. Um, yeah, uh, managed resources are something that allow you to take things, you tie them together. Okay, 
So I showed you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and show that I have cross plane installed. Essentially, uh, my local design cluster. Cross plane, plane. So essentially, I'm just everything's running locally. I can run NSA, um, case, class, case, CPL, um, how many nodes, all the uh, Except crossplane with running successfully here. Um, go ahead and try the virtual network. And this is all of the specification I went ahead and sent to crossplane. This virtual network looks like a way, uh, very, very good ones have a network, since it just does the address things. Now, like I said earlier, positions you can kind of tie together. So, um, the ML, which is not fun, fun to write. Uh, but once you get it set up, it essentially ties into kind of. Uh, I, I'm here specifying that when I ask for this specific thing, which right now is called G, this specific thing, it does, it, it, ties, it ties into subnet in a very specific way, the way I set it up. So now, and try to get my own uh, kind of setup and application. And I want it to look a certain way um, with the specification. I'll, all I have to do is now this very succinct kind of API. Um, and this API is that greater kind of oil oil of YAML, the YAML, and we'll provision that. So cross plane has allowed me to kind of use the like add the resources to kind of plug them in together. Kind of a smaller API that I can use to what here. So this ties in earlier about the internal platform. Uh, when you're working in these large systems, you kind of want to specify look, if you have an application and you want to ship it on Azure, AWS, or anything specific, uh, you have to do it a certain way. You have to put your standard security policy, put your standard resource guard. All of this right now is through people. You have to, you have to give if you have to, someone has to go ahead and check it. Uh, someone has to go ahead and if you go ahead and do all this before this five, look, you have application. All you can do online is to use my composition. This is a cross plane is automated all of it. Go ahead and say now, for example, Peter, but I want this application to be delivered in HTTPS within this cross plane uh things with resource group, which is an add specific thing. I want this to be the virtual machine center, and this to be the size of every specific EM shape. Um, you can just give this to your developers. It's kind of the punch. Like your developers go ahead and just say, look, I need these four things from you. You go ahead and do the work, and I'll get you that exact environment that specific clients will secure uh more research coverage platform. All of this and all, all of this is me. Um, so it allows us to kind of be able to create like blessed both paths, um, but it also allows us to do it easily. Um, so yeah, I see, I see a lot of kind of confused uh, faces. Um, anything, anything more so about this? Yeah. So I know this is for large scale, but they're not all large scale, but the large scale of the folder. Right. Is there any problem with that in the comments and then I'm going to get a little on this? Is there any possibility of yeah, so that's actually the beauty is that because it's using Kubernetes as a base layer, you can kind of use the entire stack uh, of Kubernetes to go ahead and implement uh, at that layer. So you can go ahead and say, look, when someone creates, let's say, this environment, you can have another uh, installation operator looking at what is happening and checking whether that matches what you or what the best of the budget. So it gives the give team, especially program managers, give this platform to be like, like, like if you're really needs to come in here and write code to check and make sure this is secure. You can write custom code because you're using Kubernetes. Uh, you can write a resource code, you can go ahead and write its own code and say, 
okay, let me make sure that all the applications are in place. Um, like, because of the very of this with Kubernetes, go ahead and write your custom pages, your own custom control that you tie in. So your, your financial, your pinups is different than my talk and somebody else's. We can now have a program you can kind of create these policies in, in these, uh, in these so, and so that's the beauty of using Kubernetes as your big platform, as your big layer. Um, you can't do this, right? Uh, and I can get into that. Uh, I think I've got kind of uh, uh, Yeah, so you do this with Terraform. This is why this is the next layer up. You know, you have a lot of things on Terraform. Terraform, you have to prepare it flows. You have to uh, plan this and apply this. Uh, if you want to have any you have to write that, right? You have to go ahead and say, uh, look, if you're going to create this environment, you send it to uh, the entity, or, uh, or you have to write custom GitHub runners, or check everything, uh, and then uh, you, you finally get approved to apply. You can get the ability to create these cloud resources. Um, another thing about comparison to Terraform is debugging. The debugging, the debugging Terraform is way easier. And debugging cross plane cross plane is hell because of Kubernetes. Uh, you have Kubernetes, a lot of like, you know, what's going on here with the Terraform, you get errors back, like error immediately. Uh, so you, you kind of make a trade off of being able to use the, the programming tools that Terraform or the Terraform with cross plane. It really is a lot of use. And drift detect, honestly, the self like I said, we're trying to build a platform. Uh, but someone can go ahead and change everything. And then Terraform itself is like, okay, something changed. I don't know why. It's up to you to figure it out. But crossplane, you can do that. Crossplane, like I said, constantly checking what, what you say you want and check and go ahead and put those things on the Azure. So if you go ahead and change something on the Azure side, crossplane will be like, oh, it's easy. I have to change. Yeah. What is Drift? So, yeah. So, Drift, yeah, that's good. Drift is, I created something. Uh, I created a couple of users for a machine. This is what I want. And Drift is, okay, they went to the Azure platform, they, they changed it. And Drift is that, like, oh, this is what I want. Like, it's like, you know, not knowing what happened. Why is my resource? Why is my database changed? Look at that. Why is it? You drifted from things. You drifted. So, in general, you kind of have to do it. Uh, it's up to you. You're figuring out how to do it. How does like a different kind of automobile like Yeah. Yeah. So we can go ahead and define how many have we So there are like not thing is you have to look at the process to be able to count. But that's similar how to have like yeah, maybe, you know, the uh, yeah, and also kind of like maybe use like local abstraction to kind of how many, how many, um, yeah, so it's very important to specify there how many you want. Um, Yeah, that's a great question. 
it, 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 it itself is stuck wherever options are. So, integration, worker, restrict type of things. You can set up a process to be able to kind of create only interface or It's a very convenient configuration on a cross plane. Right? Yeah, you can talk to external. Itself comes with people. That secret, comes with secrets. Use those also and tie in. Like I said, the beauty of it is it ties into the Kubernetes ecosystem. Whatever you use in Kubernetes, you can use with And that's a lot of the ecosystem that you can use because Kubernetes API is just a. Yeah. It leans completely on the Kubernetes. Right. You like if these level of check that we have, yeah, I probably wouldn't do the level, and you can't go. I might do that level, but yeah, if you do it. By default, the Kubernetes are that kind of setup. Um, so you have to uh, use Terraform Kubernetes plus the Brian role, and you don't use the uh, That's that. That's actually, uh, yeah. This button creates an API for EPS plus Yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So is it correct to say that all the things you use for your resource and you access it like some authors or you can describe? Yeah, I mean so if if like cross plane is when like in the in the company grows more engineering, if you're realizing you don't really developers focus on tying together all the resources. And you have these ideas like, okay, this is what's it that one particular resource level. Now I just want to automate these environments application development. And I'd be like, I'll explain like that bring that in automatically. With Terraform, it's imperative flow, it means it's up to an client plan uh, to deal with. Uh, sure that the environment is the way it is. Um, okay. Uh, well, anything out there? I didn't know anything out there. I think other kind of aspects of infrastructure as code tool. Um, it does have this fun thing called function. So, if you like, uh, uh, you need to kind of further the fact that Kubernetes, so you all of Kubernetes, all of the good things about Kubernetes. Uh, uh, Terraform, Terraform comes out with a way of not using CL, the language. Go ahead and use what you want, uh, JavaScript, Python, TypeScript, PHP, uh, to do Terraform. Bloom is an interesting one. I've been a few minutes for certain people as a public tool. I'm do it. Same language acknowledgement. Uh, you don't have to uh, jump into the learn how to do these well. Uh, and with the great language, this is wild for me. Uh, it is essentially like a programming language, in which you can code your application and your infrastructure uh, specifications all in one language. Uh, so that means if you're, if you're trying to do a this, you can be in there specifying your database, as well as your network code. Uh, interesting, so I'm kind of available on it, but I don't know it. And so, thank you.
couple of favorites. If you had trash, you could throw it out. Um, and if you borrow a chair, I'm on those desks, turn the chair. And if you have a stool, come along over there. You go over here. Please help me bring those back quickly. There's pizza left. Eat it. Um, we will do that. Uh, so from here on out, we have to switch the day around because we will be able to spend here. Um, generally speaking, we are going to have to meet on the third third of each month. Just kind of a heading because it says tomorrow's book. Anyway, so long story. Here on out, the year, other than the May 6th special event that we're going to run is going to be the career event. You can kind of from the end of that meet up will be the third Thursday. Okay. Uh, other than that, see you then next month. Uh, feel free to hang out with everybody. It's Nine-ish, a lot of time, um, but yeah, any any help? Thank you.